Okay, I'm talking to uh, Harry Shapiro, who's a journalist, and he's, this is your, your first conference on uh, Global Forum and Nicotine, and you've been asked to come along and uh, provide an overview of the conference. So I'd like to get the first taste of what your thoughts have been so far. Well, I've spent pretty much all of my working life working in the world of, of illegal drugs, working mm -hmm. for different charities. Um, and yes, this is my first taste of a, of a very different environment and it's been both fascinating and appalling. Right. <laughs> right. So it's been fascinating because I had you know, for some vague idea of the e-cigarette controversy but no idea really how vehement the debate was, yes. how it's pretty much torn global public health asunder really. Yeah and that you've got all these competing interests and uh, as far as some people are concerned junk science and, and, and just the whole issue has, has been a complete eye-opener but also in terms of what the crossovers are between harm reduction in, in the drug world that I know and harm reduction as it relates to, to e-cigarettes compared to, to uh, cigarettes yeah. and now the appalling bit the appalling bit has got nothing to do with the conference, but I'm just appalled really at how much the evidence and to me the pretty clear health harm reduction benefits um, have not only been ignored by a large section of, of uh, regulatory bodies, international health organisations yeah. and national health organisations, not only ignored but deliberate attempts made to undermine the research. Um, the start of this conference was a film called A Billion Lives. Yes, very powerful. And that represents the WHO's estimate of how many people are going to die from smoking related diseases this century. But by the same token, it's the same WHO that are doing seemingly everything they can to demonise e-cigarettes, put them exactly in the same category as, as cigarettes, and in effect put out a message of quit or die yeah. without any middle ground. And um, I suppose the other, the other fascinating element to this, which it certainly is not the case in the world that I come from, is the fact that big tobacco are in the room. Yes. And and it's almost like going to a drug conference and having a coffee with someone from a Mexican drug cart. <laughs> it's, yes. you know, that's not going to happen. Yeah. And presumably, again, I'm not new to this, but presumably a few years ago, it might have been uh, unheard of for big tobacco to be in the same room as public health professionals and oncologists and cardiologists talking about this kind of, kind of subject. Um, so all in all, uh, fascinating. Um, and I can see from all the discussions there have been about the regulations that are due to come in force and have come in force, that it's going to be a real uphill battle yes. for the for e-cigarette uh, champions, for the vaping community, and for the people who are doing absolute hard science on this to be able to get that public message across. Yeah. Yes, it's interesting how much this is driven by prejudice and ideology rather than science. As, as somebody said to quote Jerry Stimson, it's uh, ev uh, policy-based evidence rather than evidence-based yeah. policy. I mean, I, th I think um, there are certain things that are quite clear to me that Probably the debate might not be quite so vehement uh, if Big Tobacco had not decided to invest quite heavily in this whole area of e-cigarettes. So from a time when life was probably quite simple, really, yeah. there was Big Tobacco on the one side and all the health professionals on the other, and that was a clear division of kind of good and evil, if yeah. you like. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, Big Tobacco are not charities, they're businesses and they're out to make money, and, and they wouldn't deny that themselves. But they have begun to put their toe in the water of what they see is, uh, you know, over the years, a significant 
um, commercial opportunity for them. It also is likely to be tremendously life-saving. And I can understand how some health professionals, given tobacco's history, yes, would be yes, extremely yes. cautious, worried, suspicious, and all the rest of it about all of this. I think also um, it's been quite disingenuous the way nicotine and cigarette smoking has kind of been wrapped up. Um, I heard somebody say about some survey that was done that 70% of GPs in a certain area thought that nicotine was carcinogenic. Yes. And I think probably if you stop people on the streets, they would probably think the same thing. Whereas I've learned since I've been here that nicotine is a relatively benign substance. Otherwise, presumably, it wouldn't be in nicotine replacement therapy and, and nicotine yes. gum and all the rest of it if it was that problematic. Um, but it does ping various bits of the brain that mean people, you know, want to keep in, uh, experiencing it. And I think maybe too, that too uh, is a bit of a problem for certain, you know, international and national health organisations that just that don't like the idea of that kind of craving being encouraged. Um, so you're getting all sorts of stuff about, you know, e-cigarettes being a gateway drug um, and uh, that it's going to renormalize smoking which of itself is ridiculous when you look at the falling rates of smoking against the rising rates of e -cig. I mean if that was true then smoking rates would be going back up again and they, they clearly yeah. aren't and so there's all sorts of examples of this um, and I mean one particular example that stood out for me in terms of putting obstacles in the way of this uh, the Federal um, Drug Administration in America demands they're now making on clinical evidence if you want to get a product to market. Uh, and one speaker said that, that, that in uh, making their submission to the FDA, it ran to 120,000 pages. And I mean, that is incredible. But what's interesting about that is that on the one hand, um, a lot of the, re the pro e-cigarette research is being not ignored by health organisations, yet at the same time the FDA is demanding that level of research evidence. Yes. So you can't really have it both ways, you either kind of accept the evidence that, uh, about, about the virtues of e-cigarettes and its, its health benefits, or you don't. It's I mean, strange <laughs> to think that if we'd applied the same standards to penicillin or the vaccination, we would probably well, yeah. still be waiting for the Well, exactly, and that's now. the other thing, because the sort of get-out-of-jail-free card for a lot of critics seem to be, well, we don't really know what the long-term effects are going to be. Well, OK. I think nobody is saying that e-cigarettes are 100% safe. It's all a question of relative risk. Yeah. And Public Health England in the UK came out with a report a few months ago that said e-cigarettes were 95% safer than cigarettes. Yeah. Well, I think, to me, and then the Royal Society of, of, of Physicians, again in the UK, came out with a pretty similar kind of report about the... And to me, uh, as a non-smoker and a non-vapor, uh, it seems like a bit of a no-brainer, really. OK, yeah. we don't know what the long term... But if you're saying right now you can deliver something that's 95% safer, which has got to represent huge savings of, of life globally, then, you know, come on, guys. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Harry. All right. Thank you very much.